Could you present yourself? Sure. So my name is Jeffrey Rockwell. I'm a professor of philosophy and digital humanities at the University of Alberta. Um, I started my career, with, all my degrees are in philosophy, but when I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto, I started, I became an Apple Research Partnership partner. And it was a sort of program, this is back in the uh, late 80s. It was a program that Apple ran to <laughs> partly to fund graduate students to evangelize uh, the Macintosh and, and HyperCard and stuff like that. And um, right around the time HyperCard came out, I ended up be becoming the the HyperCard trainer guru and stuff like that for computing okay. services. And HyperCard was in, you know, it came out in 86. It was, it was very empowering for a lot of uh, humanists because it was a, it was a multimedia development environment. It was free. You could develop things fairly easily. You weren't having to learn C, C++ or something like that. And you could control interface and code. You had both sort of woven together. I mean, nowadays, I guess, Visual Basic fills somewhat of a similar niche or something like that. But uh, I remember, just just to give an example, that uh, you know, I don't know, a year after HyperCard came out, somebody was telling me there were like 70 HyperCard stacks for learning Arabic. You know, just all sorts of language instructors, all sorts of people just took to it. So that's how I got sort of started. And then, and then I started in 89. Um, I started working full time for uh, the University of Toronto Computing Services. Um, I was only in my second year of my PhD. I wasn't, I wasn't getting a lot of funding. So working full time and I had a son was born. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was good for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that was a tremendous apprenticeship working right in computing services. And one of the things, uh, uh, my job, initially I was supporting text applications and word processing, but then I w moved into instructional technology, again, hyperbar and similar multimedia development environments and so on like that. Um, and that was a fabulous apprenticeship. I was I was very lucky, you know, given that I did not have a computer science or technical background to be embedded in the group that were actually one of the groups was was running the academic internet for Canada. And when the web came out, you know, the guy literally next door to me was one of the first people to sort of explore the web um, at Toronto, and he wrote. Uh, he wrote a book that went on to be a bestseller. He's one of the first people. So we were, it was a very generative group. I was very lucky. Um, I finished my PhD. Uh, no, I didn't. I got a job before I finished my PhD. I got an academic job running the Humanities Media and Computing Center at McMaster University. They were looking for someone who had uh, a PhD in the humanities, and I was close to getting mine done. Um, and a significant project management experience in computing because we were running a bunch of labs, we were running software development and so on like that. So there weren't, to be honest, there weren't a lot of people who had, you know, I don't know, I think I had four or five years of actual full-time computing staff and I had risen to a sort of project manager level. So I was, again, I was very lucky. It was the first humanities computing job advertised as a humanities computing job in Canada, the first academic job where they, so that was at McMaster and there I, I ran a shop. I had staff, uh, I had programmers. A lot of what we did was uh, run labs at McMaster people were just discovering the web so I, I you know I brought the web in we created the first website for the faculty of humanities we started building websites for people and so on like that but uh, when I was at Toronto my supervisor was John Bradley John Bradley was the lead designer of tact tact was one of the best text analysis environments of its generation 
It was released in 1989 at the uh, the first joint ACH LLC conference. So the first, there had been sort of two separate scholarly associations, the Europeans and the North Americans. And the first joint conference was in Toronto in 1989. I was right there. Uh, George Landau, who was a big name in hypertext studies, was supposed to run a workshop on hypertext. He got sick. <coughs> I had to take it over. So I taught my hypercard workshop for a week, which I got everybody building hypertext things. And then the conference, Ted Nelson showed up at the conference. Uh, Northrop Fry gave a talk. It was fabulous. It was a, uh, and um, there was a software exhibit. And at the software exhibit, for example, um, I was there showing HyperGuard stacks that I built for managing bibliographic management tools and note taking. And I was right across from <coughs> Ellie Malonis, who was a graduate student at Harvard, building the first versions of the Perseus TLG search tool. So the TLG was, this, uh, it, it was all of Greek texts, all the important texts in Greek. And the way you normally accessed it is you had to buy an Ibicus, which was a dedicated workstation with a CD-ROM with the Greek fonts built in. And the Harvard, the Perseus folks, and Perseus a project that's still going, Apple had released a, a CD-ROM player and they built an extension to HyperCard that could read the CD-ROM. So all of a sudden, anyone who could get a, a hold of the CD-ROM, instead of having to buy a $20,000, a dedicated workstation. If you could get the CD-ROM, a Mac with a CD-ROM player and with the HyperGuard stacks, you could search all of Greek literature. This was big data, you know, in 1989, big data in the humanities. In fact, I published a paper about, with, with a colleague about, you know, how in some ways we were experimenting with big data questions, you know, what can you ask when you have all of ancient Greek literature? I digress. I, I, I do talk too much. And this is, <laughs> so anyway. Okay. But the long and the short of it is that that was sort of my getting started. I got very interested in text analysis, working under John Bradley. He and I started uh, building environments. We were very interested in, in visual programming environments. So at the time, you know, a Silicon Graphics workstation, you could get a a visual programming environment for programming visualizations, for scientific visualizations. I can't remember the name of it, but we decided, okay, let's build one for humanities. And we worked with, um, by the time I got to McMaster, I got, um, I got uh, a programmer in the high, com the high performance computing group interested in this. And we actually developed, I think using Visual Basic then, we developed a prototype and we published a paper on it, um, you know, where you could drag out little boxes. Uh, now there's that great environment, Orange, which allows you to do that sort of visual programming with Python under the hood. Um, I would say that was a prototype. It was never, I mean, it worked, but it was a prototype. Then in... Um, Probably the thing that really changed uh, in uh, at McMaster, uh, we recruited Stefan Sinclair, who came to work with me at McMaster. He he was a genius. John Bradley and I had built a web-based visualization environment that did uh, correspondence analysis and uh, and uh, keywords and context and stuff like that. But you had to index the text using using the make base tool of tax separately and then you had to set it up so it was, it was it was very clunky the visualizations were interesting but it was very clunky uh, stefan sinclair as part of his phd thesis had built a system called hyperpo because he was very interested in ulipo and okay. hyper and hypertext and he was doing a phd in french okay. at queens and so he built this Iperpol, which where you could upload the text to the web, it would index it, and then it would build a display with, with different sort of keyword and context statistics and that sort of stuff. So we recruited him to McMaster. Um, and I had at the time, I got one of the first really large 
CFI grants in the humanities, these were infrastructure grants. So it was about $6.7 million. And a big chunk of it was to build a text analysis portal. Remember portals? This, this idea that you could build an environment that would that. do everything. And so we built this all singing and dancing. I mean, we, to be honest, that one we contracted with, we had a professional development team, but but uh, we were following a sort of agile methodology every week. Stefan and I were there with the, with the head of the program. What team. time around, around what time? It's 2002. Okay. We got the grant and we heard about it in 2002. The building was happening in 345. TAPOR, Text Analysis Portal for is still working. But what happened is that uh, as part of the portal, we built a bunch of uh, small sort of web services that did specific text analysis things, and we called them Tupperware. Tupperware, Tupperware. Bed footy? Anyway. Okay. Simultaneously, Stefan was rethinking Hyperpo, Hyperpo. Anyway, at a certain point, we realized the portal model was too unwieldy. I mean, either we had to get, you know, a million dollars a year to keep development is like that. This was not going to be sustainable for the type of funding you get in the humanities. So what we did is we took the best parts of the portal and we split them into two. So we top or became the discovery, how you can find out about tools and document them. And Voyant became the, uh, it was, it was called an originally Voyeur. And it became the um, the actual set of text analysis tools. It was sort of inspired by Eperpol, but so we sort of, in some ways, sort of broke it up into smaller pieces that we could support. And even if we didn't have a grant, we could still, you know, coast for a year or two. And then uh, Stefan and I began a praxis of uh, agile praxis, where the two of us we would get together in a room and we would try to do a project in a day. And, as, and, and, you know, one of us would be at the keyboard and one, you know, the sort of agile pair programming. One, one would be at the keyboard, one would be sort of doing research, checking things out, and something like that, and then we'd swap. Um, and the goal there was we wanted to do a lot of projects and see, you know, what tools were useful, what wasn't useful. We, we just, we'd cobble together what we have. And then when we got something that worked, we'd implement it for Voyant. And that's why you know we began to build. And at a certain point, we realized that the word voyeur in English has no positive connotations. In French, in French, it's okay, <laughs> a little bit better anyway. In, in English, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. So we switched to voyant. Some good friends of ours actually politely told us this is not the right word for what you're doing. We love it, but it's not the right word. So at that point, you know, both of us, we had the academic problem of we've got to publish. So to some extent, our approach was this praxis of we would, we plan a project, we would do it. We'd on the one hand update Voyant. On the other hand, we would write a paper that we would give at a conference and the papers became a book. So Voyant 2.0 was released I want to say 2016, it was probably released before that, but uh, our book came out in 2016, so Hermeneutica. And, you know, this was the, the compromise, or not a compromise, it was in our case, you know, by making sure that we had these hybrid products, a book and software together. And the yeah. book illustrated the software, the software supported, in some ways, made the book possible. Uh, people could then experiment with uh, with us, and that that was sort of the praxis that we that we developed and continued. The main tool you've been doing that's the that's where your narrative ends is uh, voyant tools. Mm -hmm. What tools do you consider you're doing? So we've seen that you participated to a number of tools along the way, but like for instance, today how many of them are still? Alive, or how many of them would you consider tool and not just prototypes? So, a lot of the tools that I did were really more websites, and, and it, you know, like many websites have fallen, you know, I spent a certain amount of time trying to maintain them and stuff. <laughs> Or, actually, nowadays, more and more, I spend my time writing grants. 
get the money to hire people, you know, so um, in some ways to to keep these things going. But Blount is the main one. And okay. uh, really, you know, all the Tupperware tools and the previous ones, Hyperbo, all that was sort of <coughs> replaced by Boyant. And to some extent, Tupperware. Tupperware isn't that complicated. I've got some other projects I think are cool, but they're nothing like t Boyant, just to give you some numbers, has about 200,000 or more unique users a year. I mean, so that, that took off in a way that nothing else and that just creates its own dynamic. You know, when you have that many people, um, we, you know, Stefan and I had to sort of move to a more, I don't know, I would say professional, more production-oriented thing. Okay. And, and of course, you know, the Academy does not reward production. I can't sit there and say, you know, uh, we now have just released you know, Voyant 2.3. Uh, and it might have been as much work as three articles, but, you know, I got I got credit for Voyant and, 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 uh, and Hermeneutica, and that was it. You know, you don't get it again and again unless you do something dramatic. Would you say that the truly is made for social scientists, humanists, both? It's made for humanists. Humanists. I, I would say textual scholars. It is a text analysis and visualization environment. Having said that, I, I happen to know that all sorts of social scientists and other people use it. I, you know, I get emails from lawyers who use it. I an email from the son of a doctor whose, whose father, the doctor, uses it. So, yeah. It gets used by a lot of people. For the record, so we understand that it's a, it's a tool with a UI. Yeah. And does it include visualizations? Yes, quite a few. It's got, it, in some ways, it's a set of tools that you can compose a dashboard, if you will. It's got about 23 tools. Uh, many of them are visualization tools. Some of them are standard, you know, word clouds, distribution graphs. Some of them are wacky. So it's got a mix of, there's a bunch of tools that a lot of people don't, it's not in the default skin. People don't play with uh, that much, but they're there and they're fun. Would you think that Voyant Tools is a tool for anyone? So Voyant Tools, I think, I think um, that there are two features to the, the breadth of people that use it. So first of all, we built language skins in and we got volunteer teams. So we support something like 13 languages. As a result, uh, you know, uh, people in France can share it, can use it in French. And in fact, there's a, there's a French infrastructure team that have installed their own Voyant server. So that's one thing that I think uh, the ability, and it handles Unicode, so the ability to handle any different languages as long as they're encoded. And we, we did a certain amount of work, not me, this was Stefan on solving problems of like Japanese and, and Hebrew and Arabic. But having the language skins, and many of the groups that developed the language skins were DH groups that wanted to teach with it. So, you know, a guy in, uh, I think it was in Dubai, developed an Arabic language skin, you know, because he wanted to teach and he wanted it to be in Arabic. And people wanted it in French and Spanish and Russian and so like that. So, so my sense is, is it gets used a lot as an introductory tool, especially for teaching uh, humanities students. And when you think about it, you know, they don't have to install anything. You can get a text into it in all sorts of different ways. You, you just sort of get the text in and then you just click away and start playing. It works well for that, for that introduction. Scott Weingarten, Scott Weingarten called it, uh, you know, the gateway drug for digital humanities. It's, it's a very, it's a great entry level tool. And so that okay. makes it widely used. And when you think about the pattern of use in the digital humanities, you know, humanists, they don't do research every day of the week or every week of the year. 
you know, they're teaching and then all of a sudden they do a bunch of research. They need, they need tools that they can pick up quickly, use intensely, put down and then not use for six months. It's not like email that they're doing every day. And so I think that works well. It's free, so anyone can download it and run it locally. Is it open source? It's open source. You know, that may be great, but I don't know of anybody who has looked at this. Oh, that's not true. I only know of one team that has gone in and done something with the code where they wanted to change something and then reverted it back to us. Would you see yourself as a professional developer? No. Are you self-taught? I have taken programming courses, but not at the level of, of a professional. And in the two, you do code for the two? I do almost no coding now. I do grant writing. And I have, uh, we have a, a digital humanities student that started working on it and he does most of the programming now. You, you see yourself as an academic? Yes. And of course, I guess you publish papers? Yes. Are you proud of coding or having coded or is it something you tend to hide? No, I love it. I actually, first of all, I should say one of the one of the things that we've done with Voyant is we built a notebook programming environment with it. So I do program in that, but I tend not to touch the 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 underlying infrastructure because that code is too complex for me, and I don't. Uh, but I tend to really like programming. I you know back when I was doing the hypercard and teaching programming, I like to. One of the things I love to do is to teach humanities students to program. You know, I often teach them uh, data analysis in Python. You know, we, we have them work in CoLab and stuff like that. Um, and there's a sort of aha moment when somebody who's been told that they couldn't, that they were bad at maths, that they couldn't program. And when I teach them to program, you know, I think I spend a lot more time talking about the culture of programming and... You know, I talk about things like brain fuck, you know, the, the, you know, the playful programming languages that are developed. And I try, to, I try to get them to not feel excluded by the culture of programming. And then there's this moment when they get something to work. Uh, that's, that's fabulous. And, um, you know, I wish I was a better programmer. I wish I had the time to be a better programmer. And I'm pretty sure that if I did have the time, you know, if I had six months and, you know, spent all every day, two hours a day, I probably would be. But I could learn Japanese in that time too. You know, there, there's, you know, there's so many hours in the day. Was the tool initially made, or is it still today made as a part of an academic job? That's, I, I think one of the, the genius things that we did was we, by developing this praxis of experiments, we were able to make the development, we were able to make sure that we got academic credit for the tool because we were always, we were always developing the tool and develop and writing papers, delivering conference papers, eventually a book, MIT Press, you know, it's a, um, uh, so we, we always made sure that, you know, every summer we had two or three papers and conferences, the papers reported on, you know, They, they were often papers which had an academic component, but then we would say, you know, we're, we're also adapting this, this tool. We're, we're playing with social network analysis, and here you can see how we tackle this problem. So, so that was, you know, I think everyone in the digital humanities has to find a way. Everyone, you know, the, I, my colleagues in computer science have some of the same problems. <coughs> Nobody's going to give them tenure for writing code. On the other hand, they won't give them tenure just for writing theory. Well, maybe they would, or, or math or something like that. So they're, they're always, you know, they're always getting the grant, getting the PhD student to write the code, writing the paper with the PhD student. They're, they're these sort of mix of collaborations. Was it joyful to make the two painful both? So the original portal was scary because of the size, you know, the size of the amount of money we were spending on it the commitments, the promise, you know, in some sense, you get a big grant, you, you made a big promise. That was very scary. Um, especially, 
you know, when you're promising that you can build something that your colleagues will use and then they don't use it, you know, you know how many people have built great tools that nobody uses? Um, and so in some ways, Voyant was the second pass, the, you know, breaking Voyant and Tapor apart and making smaller, you know, things that did one thing well or one cluster of things. And then at a certain point, we realized this is very popular. You know, we don't have the problem of nobody using it. Now we've got the problem of how to maintain it. Um, yeah. Are you proud of making wild? I think so, yeah. yeah. In fact, you know, I don't think anyone will ever read the books and the articles. You know, Voyant, well, even Voyant will disappear, you know. Um, but I think uh, I certainly am known for Voyant. People will, you know, just even in this, this retreat, a couple of people have come up to me and said, oh, I teach for Voyant, you know. You know, nobody comes up to me and says, oh, I read an article you wrote. Could we say you're, you're the designer of Voyant? Stefan was the, was the designer. Uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was the beat, I was the vice president, the vice designer, if you will. Um, I was more the theorizer often. Um, and he, he was the interface designer. And so he, was, he was the, uh, I mean, he really had a good visual eye in some ways. Um, And he loved to program and he hated writing papers. Whereas I like to theorize and. Are you a co-maintainer? Well, now, so Stefan Sinclair passed in 2020. So now in some ways uh, uh, I'm responsible. The, the, there's a programmer who does the day-to-day -day stuff. And as I said, I, I write grand science or emails. I test things. I don't touch the code any longer. I touch the code in, in Spidal, but not the main code. So how, what would you say you're doing as a role of different roles you're doing for the project? I would say I'm project manager. How long do you see yourself having been doing that tool? Um, so I think the very first tool that uh, I made with John Bradley, the tact web, That was the beginning of the path. Um, and that was 94. I think we presented Tact Web. I believe it was the first time anyone presented text visualization, at least text visualization, a, a paper on text visualization on the web, anyway. We presented it at the ACH LLC at Paris, and I think it was 94. And uh, For what it's worth, I can still remember a very important person in the community basically saying, this isn't digital humanities, you know, this is, you know, there isn't an argument here that, you know, that this is just a pre-visualization and it was, yeah, it's cute, but that's when I realized because John Bradley and I had been immersed in some ways in scientific visualization and we've been looking at all the tools that they had and the rhetoric and it, It was a little bit of a surprise for me to suddenly realize that my own community were going like, eh, this isn't serious. I mean, to be fair, they, this was just one person and they swung around and... and uh... Does Voyant do what you wanted it to do? So Voyant does not do some things that I'd like it to do. So it, it's a moving target, especially when you're, when you're trying to make something that is... Uh, some sense current, it's a continually moving target. And this is one of the problems with us academics. We're not, we're not rewarded for, for production systems. So right now we're spending a lot of time thinking about how can we build, uh, you know, there's a whole new world of what I'm going to call AI tools. So we have topic modeling, We, we just redesigned the topic modeling so that it works quite smoothly. We have named entity recognition, but that's very compute intensive and Voyant is meant to be fast and interactive. So compute intensive things are a problem. What we really need now is to be playing with word embedding and, uh, and stuff like that. And that's going to be a challenge to do right. You know, and it may just be that I have to, well, 
to be honest, the thing I look at, you know, I've been experimenting with chat GPT four and code and a code interpreter where you can now do text analysis, just with a series of prompts, you know, you upload a text and you say, you know, give me a graph of the high frequency words. You know, I, I have the suspicion that the days of violent may be coming to an end and the days of, in some sense, the return of the command line or the prompt line are that that will become the new paradigm and for data analytics. And it won't just be Voyant, it'll be Tableau, it'll be all sorts of tools that get, in some sense, uh, replaced by these other, by these new tools. So, your feelings about the tool did change over time? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they would, and I anticipate them continuing to change. Okay. To be honest, right now, I'm nearing retirement. My feelings right now is I want to find a way to gracefully pass this on to someone else. You know, I don't, I don't want this. I don't. Is it the first time you want to pass it on? No, no. And it's not, I, you know, I've put a lot of work and I've gotten a whack of money. So I have probably enough money for five years and I'm going to use those five years to pass it on or let it die. I'm also going to use it. I think the underlying infrastructure needs to be renewed. Like, like all these things, it's, it's, it's a stack of things. The underlying text engine is Lucene. That needs to be replaced. When I consult with people who know more about these things, they say, you know, Elasticsearch, you know, you should start shifting. The JavaScript library that we use is getting a bit dated. Do you even know who uses the tool? No. I mean, I know some people use it. I just met... You know, one of the people here says he teaches, uh, the guy, uh, Brittany, he says he teaches it all the time. I never do that. And I certainly don't know his students. But you gave me a fear, like 200,000 unique users. You have a, a quantitative idea. From, uh, yeah, I have the quantitative. That's from Google Analytics. So we don't. Okay. And I should say, by the way, is one of the things, that's just the people who are using our server. You can download and rent, and we know about other remote servers. And some of those people tell us that they're running a remote server and that's great. And there's almost people, when I Google Voyant, I find interesting papers. There's a group of people, I think in, actually in Denmark, I think somebody, I think I came across some PhD theses that were using Voyant and I'm going like, hmm. Do you interact with your users? The ones who interact with me, yeah. Yeah, so I get, I get a regular flow of emails and I try to answer quickly. The other thing I do is I've developed, uh, well, when COVID hit, I developed, uh, well, Stefan and I developed, but this was, uh, this was when he wasn't well, a set of hands-on self-study, you know, you know, teach yourself voyant. And we released them as a series of under a CC 4.0, you know, Anyone can download them, rewrite them, do whatever they want to these, these things. So, so in some ways, trying to anticipate people who teach with Voyant and give them a series of lessons and they can pick the ones they like and they can rewrite them and they can jam them together. They can do whatever they want. They can sell them. It's, uh, I think the only thing, I think the four, BY 4.0 is they just have to give us credit at some point. So I interacted with people who use those. And of course I interacted, I used them myself and tested them with my students. Um, another way is, is one of the things I, I've been willing to do anytime somebody asks me, would you, you know, zoom into my class and give an intro to Voyant? I say, yes, I can give those in my sleep now. Um, and so I do, I give a, on a regular basis, I get, you know, either I just come in and talk about Voyant or I run a, you know, a one hour session to folks in Greece about Voyant, you know, anything I can do. And so I get a certain amount of feedback from that. You making Voyant and also the other people making Voyant, is it underappreciated, overappreciated in the academia, outside of the academia? What, what's your feeling about that? It's underappreciated for purposes of tenure and promotion. The, the, in the humanities, 
academic uh, credit is given mostly for, especially in the humanities, for books. In the social sciences, it's more articles, but you know, books are the, the coin of the realm. Articles also, grants less so. Building websites and tools, you, you get some credit for it, but it's not, uh, you know, you know I, I go up every year with a couple of articles and then maybe I've got a website or something like that. And as far as I can tell, that's what gives me the ticks. And I, if I didn't have them, I'm pretty sure that they would probably recognize the website work or the tool work. They would recognize that as an adequate replacement, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't warm their hearts. That's just at the university I'm at. Um, and so, and as I said, in some ways we developed a praxis such that we made sure that we always were getting peer reviewed articles, grants, papers, books. Doing that as a way of illustrating the tools, theorizing them, talking about them, and so on like that. In the tool, which type of design decisions did you make that were specific to the humanities? So one of the primary things is you can always get back to the to the text. In fact, you know, in the default view, there's five panels, and the central one is the pure text. And if If you play with Voyant, they're loosely concatenated. So if you click on, you got a distribution graph for a word or a pattern, you click on that, you get the keyword in context, you click on the keyword in context, you get the full text. So they're all loosely concatenated. So you can always get back to the raw text. You know, it would be really nice if we could support formatted text. That's just beyond us at the moment. So that's one decision that we made. The second one is we don't think our users have a lot of patience. They are not going to spend, uh, I mean, there are people who will spend, you know, an hour installing Anaconda and then one thing or another and then playing around with the tools and reading the books and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a week later they get something. Our tool is meant to be this entry level. You can, you, you can either use a text we've already put up there, or you can paste some text in, or you can paste in a URL, or you can upload a text, whatever you can. And, and we will, you upload a PDF. We will try to extract the text out of it. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to get started and playing. So right here, I mean, here, here's perhaps a contradiction with what some of we've been talking about. I, I saw one of the displays up there. There are people who get their knickers in a knot over the idea of people having visualizations where they don't understand how you got that visualization. And I, I'm, I would certainly agree that people should understand it, but I think there's an intuitive way in which humanists can can partly understand it by kicking the tires of the results. So we have correspondence analysis. You know, who the hell understands correspondence analysis? Well, you're from France. Everybody understands it in France. But, but you know, it's not even a technique that was that popular outside of France. But I think it's a great technique. Uh, but, you know, you give people that display and they see the word clusters and the documents and so on like that. And they go, oh, that's sort of cool. Or you show them topic modeling. Who, you know, who really understands topic modeling? So our, our view is we want people to start playing and they will start understanding through playing. And that's, I guess, the, you know, our philosophy of, of, of dealing with this rather than putting them in a wizard situation where you have to make a series of decisions and installations. And then only if you've been a really good boy <laughs> and pass the test, do you get to see anything? What you want, the way you want the user to get engaged with all of that, you want them to learn through playing. Do you have a more constructed ideas of those practices and which one you actively support? Is it broader than that? So if we go back to that praxis, one of the things we decided to do was we were not going to build a tool based on a needs analysis of other people. We were going to build the tool that we wanted, that we needed to do the experiments that we wanted to do. So we had this, you know, the very first one we did 
and uh, was, a, you know, I described, you know, we tried to do a project in a day. Decide what the question was, find the text, grab whatever tools we had at hand, you know, try to answer those things and write up some type of summary of it. We did not finish it in a day, but we got, we got a good part of it done. And then we continued that. And so if you look at the book, if you, if you look at hermeneutica, there's a series, there's sort of theoretical chapters, and then there are these experimental chapters where we, where we walk through what we did. So that's what drove us. Uh, and so I'm going to step back and make a general statement, which is, in, in my experience, when I talk to colleagues that have never really used computer-assisted text analysis, when they describe what they would like, it's a fantasy that, that even if you give it to them, they don't actually use it. It's sort of what they think they would use, but it's not really what, it, what they don't know enough to quite be... Uh, to, to be a good, reliable guide. And in fact, I did at least, we had one grant funded project called Just What Do They Do? In which we did actually interview a bunch of people. We showed them a bunch of, you know, different screens and what you could you do this, that, or the other. And by and large, I've got to say, we had more fun and we got further just by doing what we wanted, what we thought was interesting. So in that sense, we, we have not done what the canonical, yo, you have to do a needs analysis, user studies, blah, 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 blah. We weren't building things for other people. We were building things for us and people like us. And that worked. Were you ever surprised by some of your users? Do they do what you thought they would do? Do they do like you? I was surprised by the amount that this was used for teaching. I should have anticipated it, but I should say that I only teach graduate students. I don't have to teach, I don't teach undergraduates any longer, but I, I was surprised by how many colleagues use it for that intro DH course, you know. You know, you're gonna have a one week taste of text analysis and then one week taste of something else or something like that. So that surprised me a bit. I've been surprised by some of the people who use it who I never expected to use it. Like, you know, getting this email from the son of a doctor who's saying, my father loves it. He puts all his patient records in or something. I'm going, whoa, you know, setting aside the confidentiality issues. I'm often surprised by how little people use it. There's a ton of functionality in Bionic. And I find every time, you know, people come to me and say, <coughs> can I do X? And I say, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you just go here and you do that. Sort of like, whoa, I didn't even know that was there. And to some extent, this is the problem of featureitis and feature creep of software in general. Wound has been around long enough. We keep on adding features and stuff like that. We're trying to avoid overloading the interface. So some of the features are more subtly integrated. So if you're in a list view, for example, if you, if you click in the right place, You can see a bunch of col you can check which columns you want to show. And we have, you know, we have things like Z score and something like that that people don't even realize are there because we've got a tiny little column that's just showing, you know, the word and the count. And they don't realize that you can show a whole bunch of other things. And that's gratifying to anticipate. Conversely, I find, and I think this is true of any whatever you build. Somebody's going to come back and say, yes, but do you have, there's always a wrinkle that they want. And this is the beauty of adding the notebook programming environment. You know, now I can say, okay, you know, Voyant does what it does, but you now have a notebook programming environment. You, you, you know, get a grant, hire a JavaScript programmer, and you can, you can add your own thing. And if it's cool enough, we'll take it and build it into the main, the main tool. So we're, we're actually trying to find a way not to, not to overload the interface, to support millions, you know, to support all the different people. I don't know if you've noticed this, I've been using Microsoft Word since the beginning, at least on the Macintosh. You know, every year they add another, uh, they add more crap to the toolbar and something like that. Have you ever seen those? There's pictures of if you load all the toolbars and stuff, you've got this tiny little square of text and it's just all buttons. 
And we're trying to avoid that. What I've been surprised by is code interpreter. It's nowhere near replacing Jupyter Notebooks, Colab, Voyant, but it's gonna get there. And it's, and you know, like all these technologies, the technology makes a promise and then often we have to adapt to the technology. You know, it's not like, it, it never quite fulfills the promise, but what, what I think is gonna happen is that it's gonna promise data analysis without any coding and people are going to learn prompt engineering in order to get the analysis that they want. And then there's going to be a constant flow of stories of jackasses who didn't write the right prompt. A little bit like that lawyer, they generated something which they then published a paper on. It turned out that they, that their prompt was bullshit. And, you know, would you say that Voyant empowers people and who does it empower and is the good thing? I think it empowers, uh, yes, I think it empowers people. It allows them to get a taste of text analysis and visualization, including things like topic modeling and principal component. And it allows, allows them to get a taste. And the second thing it does is we have a bunch of wacky tools. And the wacky tools send an interesting message. They, they send a message of, you can play. It empowers people have to teach in the digital humanities, especially people who don't have, I mean, you've got, you've got all sorts of skills. You probably have all sorts of infrastructure behind you, but what if you're some poor person, you know, you're the one digital humanist in a small liberal arts college, you know, there's no servers that support you. You know, it allows you to do something really interesting with your students. And I think it empowers the students through that it empowers the students to give them a taste of what's happening. It empowers Stefan and I to, in some ways, build a career around this, you know, in a way that would have been very difficult to do if we, if we hadn't. You look back on your life and you go, it could have gone very different directions. <laughs> and, and, uh, How do you find it? Is, 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 it, is it precarious to find the truth? Yeah. I find it through a combination of, you know, I try to get graduate students, <coughs> research assistants, they help with certain types of things. And then there, I, I have a programmer and I try to keep him funded. So what I, the, one of the main things I do, if you think about Voyant, because Voyant is sufficiently successful, let's say you were writing a grant and it's a big grant and there's a place for Voyant, perhaps for a different tool in Voyant. So, mm. so we do a sort of deal, you know, You write Voyant into your grant. You know, I write a letter of support or you include me as a co-I. But in turn, you put a budget line in there. So for five years, there's so much funding that comes to me to support Voyant to do what you want to do. To maybe add, you really want part of speech tagging. Did the work of doing and maintaining Voyant put you in a situation of control clash with your colleagues? I've been part of the... DH community. And, you know, I went to that first conference in 1989. I've outlasted everybody. Mm. Well, not everybody, but I'd like to think Stefan, Stefan was a genuinely kind person. He was a really good man. He was very, you know, more so than I am. He was very supportive of new scholars, graduate students. Um, you know, I, I aspire to be as supportive as he was. So I don't, I don't think we ever had a problem of jealousy or anything like that. Nobody else was really doing anything similar. And we, we, we never tried to lord it over anyone or anything like that. You know, if you wanted to collaborate with us, we we're happy to do that. If you wanted to just use it, go ahead. If you wanted to ignore it, go ahead. So I don't think um, the initial TAPOR project, the text analysis portal, that was an imperial project. And that was part of the problem is it was trying to say, we can do everything for everybody. And that was obviously unsustainable, or at least we couldn't figure out how to sustain it. Uh, whereas, you know, saying, look, we've got this thing, it's free, it's open source. You can do what you want with it. You can take the code. We've got some, you know, we're publishing papers with our ideas. You can take the ideas or disagree with them. 
I think by and large, we avoided any sort of imperial conflicts, if you will. Mm. And, you know, since then, Voyant has received some awards, which I think reflect, you know, we received the, the Zampoli Award, which is really the top award in the digital humanities for our project. Um, I think that reflects the fact that it is appreciated in the community and not seen, I hope it's not seen as silencing anybody. In fact, there's all sorts of cool tools out there. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we've silent. I hope we haven't silenced anybody. Does the tool has to go with papers or did you find ways of valuing the tool itself in academia? There certainly are people for whom the success of the tool makes it makes a difference, so to speak. But at my university, the way the annual assessment process works, um, my annual report is going to be assessed by a bunch of chairs and colleagues in the humanities, most of whom they, you know, I get along fine with them. And most of them, if I came out with a brand spanking new tool for that year would give me credit for it, but not for the next year. It'd be just like a book. You came out of the book, you get credit that year. The next year, it doesn't count. You know, the fact that you're maintaining it. So uh, that's been my experience. And it was sort of Stefan's experience too. So that's the first thing to say. What, but the tool, the one thing you can get from the tool is grants. So this is where by collaborating with people and getting grants that on the one hand maintain that, but it means that You know, we were regularly getting grants, which we would not have gotten if we weren't the authors of Voyant. We we're either on the grants because we were co-developers of a clearly successful project, or we were getting grants because people wanted Voyant as part of their project because it, you know, it would put their project over the hump to get the grant. Hmm. So that was the one direct approach. I've talked about how this sort of praxis of, of combinations. And if you actually think about it, so the, our book, Hermeneutica, Hermeneutical Things, and the thesis of the book is that in some sense, tools bear theory in a different way than texts. So a text says, you know, here's how you interpret a text, a hermeneutical text. A work of an, a, work, a theorizing interpretation would say, "Here's how you here's how you do interpretation." The tool bears a theory, but bears it differently. And so, in some ways, we were playing with this idea of tools can be theories, and we turned around and started telling people that. So, our papers, in some ways, were telling people tools are theories. Now, did that make any difference to my chair and the dean? Probably not. I don't think they read any of this stuff. But we were telling it to our colleagues in the digital humanities. And in some ways, this is one of the things that, that has come up, you know, in the 30 years that I've been in this field, on a regular basis, we have conversations about how do you get credit for digital work? I was on the MLA committee in which we developed protocols for how to get credit for digital work. You know, a digital work could be somebody creating a hypertext novel, digital artwork. I mean, all sorts of different things. So we're trying to, you know, we, we've been fighting this one for a long time. You know, I wish, I wish I had a story to tell. Jerome McGann used to say, this is only going to be solved one death at a time. The old guard just has to die. Which is sort of cynical, but... Which questions should I have asked, maybe? Two things that we thought a lot about. One is play. So I told you that Stefan, his PhD thesis was about Ulipo. So we, we thought a lot about it and we theorized about, and in some ways we played with tools. And I think there's a, you know, you asked me before, did I get any joy out of it? I think, I don't think we would have gotten where we were if we weren't getting joy out of it. And part of the joy was actually thinking about the play and the joy. And by play, you know, in English, the one use of the word play is, let's say you have a, a knob, you can fiddle with it until it breaks. 
that, you know, that sort of play, that, you know, playing with things or when things don't quite work right, they have we a... Say, we say je in French for the same thing. There you go. Yeah. So, um, so that, that sort of play, but we were also playing, there was a play between theory and implementation, which was really fun. You know, it's one thing, you know, it's like a roller coaster. You go way, way up into the theory and, and we would build this sort of theory. And most of my colleagues were not lucky enough to be able to then go swooping down, making it work, and then making it work for other people. And I don't know, that roller coaster for me was a vertigo. You know, there, there's Kawa has that theory of, of play. And I think vertigo is one of is one of the is one of the elements of play, this feeling of so that's one thing that was important. The second thing, and this is something that gets talked about a lot in the digital humanities, we've been talking about it, is the collaboration. Something that was very important for me and Stefan is year by year, we developed a partnership. It wasn't a one-off partnership. It was paper by paper, tool by tool, interface fiddle by interface fiddle. And I don't think the type of work we're doing can be done by one person. I know I could be a fairly good programmer, but uh, I, I would not be able to both, you know, Stefan was better and the two of us together could do more than apart. If I had had to do it on my own or if Stefan had had to do it on his own, we wouldn't have been as responsive. There wouldn't have been the dialogue. There wouldn't have been the enjeu, if you will, between the two of us. So I, you know, it was a blessing. And, you know, this is just one of the lucks of life is that he and I were together at the same university at the right time, wanting to do, have both of our different backgrounds, building things and so on like that. And, uh, and then once we were separate, I went to Alberta, he went to McGill, but by then we were already collaborating. So, you know, every week on Zoom, we had a, a meeting um, and then we'd get together and so on. So that collaboration, and it doesn't have to be two people, but I think these collaborations and I think a lot more attention needs to be paid to the human elements of care. How do you enjoy working on a project with someone over time? So in my family, most people Having a famous father, especially for my father and his brothers, <clears throat> was a burden. My father was a sculptor, and he could never live up to the fame of his father. My uncle was a painter. He could never live up to the fame, the fame of his father. Um, so, and when I was two years old, my parents moved to Italy, and I was raised in Italy. And I think one of the reasons they moved there was to get away from the long shadow. Not that my grandfather was a problem. He wasn't. But he was just so focused on his work. He was so famous, so young in his own way. Not, not the way Picasso was, but in a sort of pedestrian, you know, people would come up to him on the street and so on. Like so um, I was in so many ways isolated. I, I didn't really get to know my grandfather that well because, you know, he would come once a year to Italy. He'd tell me to get a haircut, go home or something like that. So I don't think I was as influenced. The members of my family who went into art are the ones that had to struggle with this. In some ways, by going into philosophy and computing, I was free. My father, my sister, to some extent, my brother, my uncles, they were all struggling with this legacy. And uh, by getting a PhD, my grandfather, after he finished high school, he went to Art Academy. You know, he didn't even really get a BA. By getting a PhD, becoming an academic, I, I was I, I relatively free. Um, but I think... What I think made a more of a difference of the sort that you're talking about was growing up as an expatriate, growing up as an American boy in Rome. You know, I, I was never at home really, or home was 
you know, so I was, I was always comfortable with the idea that I may not be doing what other people are doing. You know, we lived in a neighborhood where, you know, it was, a, it was all the other kids were Italians. And, you know, I made some Italian friends, but I went to an American school that was, you know, I think, and my wife is also an expatriate. She was born in Egypt. Her father was in the Canadian Air Force. And I think the two of us, we talk about this a lot. I think uh, there is... There's a certain freedom that comes from being an expatriate. You're not an expatriate. You're a Frenchman yeah. in Denmark. It gives you a certain, people don't quite expect you to act the way Danes do. It gives you a certain freedom. Uh, it's also a certain loneliness sometimes. Um, so that, that I, would, I would say has been more determining of my character than anything else. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. There you go.